Yeah, hello everyone. It's so nice to see all of you. Um, I'm Maya Sarkar, class of 22. My mother was uh, Malini Devanandan. She attended home school and was class of 86. And my aunt was in the class of 84. And um, it's so great to see so many people come together and share the passion for hiking. I've been a huge hiking enthusiast and got my golden tarpon in, in ninth grade about two years ago. And um, the environment and atmosphere surrounding Cody is one to be remembered. And here we are reminiscing about hiking through the ages. I look forward to hearing the many story, stories the audience may want to share in addition to the main panelists. Please use the chat box to communicate and me and Ms. Manjusha will be closely monitoring it. Our main speakers today will now be introduced. So first we have uh, Mr. Ian Lockwood, class of 88. He's an educator, photographer, and ecological enthusiast. He has a keen interest in landscape photography and the cultures of South Asia. Mr. Ian is famous for integrating a variety of photographic techniques, GIS generated maps, and texts that help his audience grasp a deeper understanding of landscape, ecology, and the culture of his region. Next, we have Ms. Pippa Mukherjee. She's a former staff member, author, and an active environmentalist with extensive knowledge of Indian flora and fauna. Her special interests include environmental management, eco-agriculture, organic farming techniques, and Indian botany. Ms. Pippa has published a con comprehensive field record, Flor Flora of the Southern Western Ghats and, pa and Palmese, a field guide. And she's soon to publish another book. Next, we have Ms. Sandra Scheniger. She is also a former staff from 1966 to 2001, and she was the 2016 Margaret Eddy Alumni Award recipient. Ms. Sandy received, received her award on May 20th during the graduation ceremonies for the class of 2016. Ms. Sandy was a missionary sent by the American Baptist Mission to teach physical education at KIS which she did for 35 long years. She was the head of the department, coaching many school teams and chaperoning sports teams to UTI. She was an active member of the church that meets at KIS, ch chaired the MSA accreditation committee on many occasions, coordinated the hiking program for years, was class sponsored to numerous classes, sang in the chapel choir, was the kingpin for every field day she was in Cody, hosted students and staff for Friday prayer breakfast, coordinating the camping program, welcomed staff and their families to her annual Christmas tree, and was involved in many, many other areas. Ms. Sandy's life in Cody exemplifies what it takes to build a community. Um, next, we have Ms. Barbara Block. She's an artist and a visual storyteller. She graduated from the class of 1976. She returned to work at KIS in 88 and has been on staff for more than 35 years, in which she has taught art, IB art, and served as high school coordinator. Ms. Block took the reins of the hiking program from Ms. Sandy and has shaped them ever since, creating new hikers and changing the point system. Currently, she's teaching visual arts and handling the archives at school. So those are our speakers for tonight, and we look forward to hearing the audience's stories as well towards the end. Uh, um, let's start with Mr. Ian Lockwood. So, Mr. Lockwood, would you like to tell us about your history with Cody Cardo, your vast history that dates so long ago? Uh, hi, everybody. Hello, family and, and uh, friends all around the world. It's, it's great to see you all. It's nice, you know, have your cameras on because I, I, uh, I can see all your faces and it's great to sort of get reactions and, and whatnot that way. Um, we, we, of course, did a talk on this idea of the Sky Islands before, and many of you were there. And um, so this, this uh, talk today sort of came out of that. Now, I just I want to highlight, this is supposed to be an interactive talk. It's rather than you know, a couple of us speaking. Uh, we, we do want you to interact. And we've got that Padlet that you can actually post pictures on. And if you don't feel like posting, you can at least go through them and, and see what other people have put up there. We hope that's actually going to go on for a while. Um, I was saying to Manjusha that we actually need to do it on other themes, maybe like field day or, you know, dorm rooms or whatever, you know, the flag green. So I think you're going to see that this is uh, something that we, we follow up with. Um, now I have, 
I have a few slides. Am I allowed to share my slides, Maya, with you on that? Yeah, of course. I, I know you asked me about my family and, and, um, and my family is very important because we were, there's several generations of us that have been, uh, you know, hiking in Cody. So it's been a, a tradition that's been passed through. And I had a chance to sort of think about how hiking changed in Cody. I was there in the 1980s and my, my you know, parents had been there in the 1950s. Um, and before that, my grandparents had, had been there and were hiking in the 1920s when it was a popular pastime. And um, I got interested in sort of documenting some of those aspects. Uh, I just wanna, I think what I wanna talk about today though, really briefly um, is, and, you know, before we talked about land cover change and some of these things, but let's just try to understand when we speak about the Palmy Hills and we speak about the, the geography of, of these, of where we're going, we need to kind of understand that because all these hikes that we talk about sort of involve these mountains. And one of the things I learned is that uh, I really didn't understand the hills while I was in school that well. I had a sort of a superficial knowledge and I, I had to, it took me many more years to come back and sort of re-understand some of those places. Um, so we wanna look a little bit at this. Um, and you know, you know, last time I, in my last show, I, I mentioned this and that is the Pony Hills are actually connected to these other ranges in, in the Western Ghats. And so the, this red circle is the area when we talk about the hiking program, it was happening in all of this. And it's kind of interesting if you hear about what Barbara is doing right now uh, in the Cody School hiking program, they can't go to many of the places that we used to be able to go traditionally. So they've had to come up with all these other hikes and they've discovered new waterfalls and new streams and places that we didn't even know were there. Um, so it's, it's been interesting how it's evolved. And I think that's one of the reasons we've got, you know, Ms. Scheniger, we've got Barbara, we've got Pippa on here tonight is to get a sense of how things have changed over this time. But I'm just gonna focus on this, uh, on, the, on, on the areas that we go to. And the, the, the key thing, some of the key hikes that we, we, you know, that were very popular and that are on our Padlet were places like Tope and Villagavi, right? So most people, like your, your beginning hikes, and here's Cody. Uh, I'm sorry, my arrow, my mom asked me to make a bigger arrow and I forgot to do it. Uh, but anyways, um, here it is, here's Cody. And you can see that most, you know, your, your very basic hikes go to, uh, over here to, to Bata Canal, to Dolphin's Nose, right? So those are your, when you're in like grade two and grade three, those are where people were going. And then if you went out a little bit further, you went down to Villa Gubby, right? And most people actually, if you're gonna to go to all the way to Villa Gubby, you're gonna go down to, to Tope. So the thing about our geography of the, of the hiking program is that we have the plateau up here where a lot of the, the short hikes were. And then some of the longer hikes, these day hikes were down into these valleys, into these deep valleys. And ideally, I think all of us in the hike, you know, in the hiking program enjoyed a stream, some kind of swim at the end of a hike. If it didn't have a, a stream or a swim, it really wasn't a good hike. Um, but so this was, you know, you can see on the contour lines here how steeply it drops, right? And this is what the amazing sort of landscape of Cody, it's very lofty, it sits up there in the 2000 meters, and then it drops almost down here, down to less than 400 meters down there. So that was one area that we were looking at. Another area, of course, is, you know, people went out to Bergem Lake. Bergem Lake was this uh, campsite that we used and uh, interesting place. And this upper plateau in my talk before, we talked about how the vegetation has changed there. But here I highlight Bergem Lake, I highlight Marion Shola, and then I think I highlight Ibex Peak here, which was, is the second highest peak in the, in the Palnese. And Van der Vu is, is right over here. If you read in our, uh, well, the other day, Clarence was sharing a really fascinating story about uh, a, a camp trip to a uh, class trip to Bandervu and then going to Munar and whatnot. So there's all kinds of stories. And I think what our challenge, of course, is to sort of record some of these. Then there's the northern slopes of the Palnese. And over here we have uh, Chinar, that's uh, the bridge. You'll see some pictures on, on Padlet there. And this is a Manjampati uh, hiking, uh, sorry, campsite that so many of us enjoyed all those years ago. Kukal over here, and then Cloudlands Peak. And that's, you know, that's sort of a very quick look at some of our, I didn't even get into like the Eastern uh, Polonies, 
where very few of us went during our school days, right? Um, but that's a, a place that now, you know, we're, we're exploring a little bit more. So I'm gonna stop sharing that. And that's pretty much, that's sort of a, a brief sort of overview of the geography. And I think we'll, we'll go on, all right? If you can take it on from there, thanks. Okay, um, that was very interesting. Uh, really, it's really good to know the whole surrounding environment around Cody and to know like what exactly we're hiking. Um, so next, we'll move on to um, Miss Sandy Scheniger. Um, if you could maybe explain to us what the hiking program was like when you joined Cody, what made you formalize the program, introducing the Tarpon system and kind of uh, forming it? Ms. Scheniger? All right. Um, well, when I came, uh, Steve Root was in charge of the hiking and he was the one that was starting to put the points on the, on the hikes. And uh, I think it was a way of record keeping. And then the, the, um, because they started the tar pin. And I think it was Steve Root and Dave Hall who was the PE teacher in, 1960, in the late 60s uh, who did the point system. So I just joined and it was uh, at that time, um, everybody who wanted to hike just got a group together and signed up a hike slip and turned it in and then went on their hike. So we had to form our own groups. And I can't remember how the students attached to the staff um, at that point. I know that two, some of us as staff just created a group every week that we could go on hikes. And so uh, we started and we just went every Saturday, but you had to take a short hike before you took a longer hike. And um, the short ones were how Ian was talking like uh, pillar rocks and, and uh, the 10 mile round and things like that. And the system that Steve made was that you got um, one point for three miles on road and one point for two miles on path and one point for one mile if it was steep up or down. And that was the way they tried to make the points for the hikes. Um, and then uh, after Steve left, there were other, uh, I think the men PE teachers ended up being the, the people who kept track of the hiking. I don't remember all, all of the names right now. And I think I started taking it over somewhere in the 80s. And um, it got to the point, at, in the early days, uh, the boys could go without chaperones overnight. The girls, uh, uh, groups could sign up to go hiking and they didn't have to have a chaperone. Uh, there was one point when uh, Tope was the only hike that required chaperones. I don't remember exactly why, but uh, I know I was booked, I think six weeks in a row to go to Tope. And uh, so I, I guess I got in condition that year. Um, anyway, uh, when I came back from a, a furlough in the eighties, I had uh, thought about making this more regular and how hard it was sometimes for kids to find chaperones. So we started setting up a set of hikes each week and, and I would get the chaperones and then the kids could just sign up. Uh, they could still make their own, but, but they could go on the ones we set up. And so then we did that. And at that point, I think the tire print was 70 points for girls and 85 for boys because the boys still had more permission to go overnight by themselves. Um, so we, we, I think the only other thing that I actually started was the tar camp. Um, I think, oh, and the 80 mile round, I was out camping with the Carmens and uh, Bob Carmen remembered doing the 80 mile round with his family as he was growing up. And so he took me on part of the 80 mile round as we came back from camp. And so then we started a weekend hike to do the 80 mile round. And uh, I don't remember where we went the first night, maybe Berejum. And then we went out and to, ended up at Mount of 
uh, Manja, uh, sorry, at, um, oh, anyway, somebody will remember. And then, uh, what? Marion Shola, Marion Shola. Yeah, we tried to stay at the bungalows. Oh, yeah. And we tried to stay on the road so that the, the uh, truck could bring out the food for us and we didn't have to cart the food. And in the early days of the 80 mile round, we did all our own cooking. Um, and then we started bringing a cook along because it was, it was not fun to get in from a long day of hiking. And then I had to start cooking dinner. So um, it was better to have a cook there. Um, what was I gonna say? Uh, for the tar camp, I got to thinking that on these hikes we went on, every week there were a mixture of people who hiked all the time and a mixture of people who just took a, one hike here and one hike there. And I thought it would be fun for people who are all avid hikers to do something together. And so we started the tar camp, which was everybody who had earned a tar pin that year. And uh, we actually started doing it in, in January so we came back from vacation, took a couple of conditioning hikes, and then we backpacked down to Manjapati. And uh, that turned out to be a really fun time. And a lot of people, some, I think some people earned their tar pins just so they could go on tar camp. But um, um, yes? Uh, speaking of tar pins, uh, they're named after the tar goat, which is known for hiking. Were they a common sight back then or? Like, why would Tarpins named after the tar goat? What, what was the question? Sorry. Um, Tarpins, they're named yes. after the tar goat. Do you know why it was named that? Well, because the tar was um, a mountain goat that was pretty, uh, I would say, pretty scarce, but they were in the hills. So it was a symbol of the hills. Um, so Who I came just, up with a name, Sandy. I don't know. Probably Steve Root. Okay. He I know it was already named. Were... I didn't. I didn't have anything to do with the naming, but you... uh, the only thing I had to do with it, it was always a pin. But I started um, having them made into rings or spoons or, or putting the tar pin in a different form so that you just didn't get a pin. And then if they got four tarpons in high school, all four years, then their uh, fourth one was a gold tarpon. So then they got a gold. Um, anyway, I stopped taking tarpons after a while because I had 31 and I didn't need any more little spoons or I have gold earrings. <laughs> I just was going to point out that around the same time there was the Tar Tribune. So for a while, I think the Tar was almost the school mascot. The magazine was called Tar, and we had the hiking Tar as well. Right. So, right. Thank you, Ms. Shanigan. Uh, very insightful. Many things that a lot of us may not have known. I'm just going to quickly divert the talk towards a member in the audience. If um, Miss Loi Knapp is in the audience. <laughs> Good morning. Um, for those of you who don't know, Miss Knapp is the class of 67 and served on staff here at KIS as Dean. Miss Knapp, I hear that hiking as a child was life changing for you. Would you care to share any, any experiences, anything with our audience? Well, I would just say that hiking was one of the highlights of being in Cody. You know, we had to go to study hall every night, but Saturday morning we could wake up and we could get out there with our friends. And, you know, we had our small groups and it was just wonderful. And I was just thinking, um, my mother was working uh, for Mr. Krause at the time and Steve Root di different times. So she was there. I lived in the dorm and she had a, a home at Wee Willie, just below, um, below the dorm. Right. Anyway, uh, she loved hiking and she won several tar pins 
That isn't unusual, but what's unusual is she wore chapels on every hike. <laughs> she never had tennis shoes or anything. And so she won all her tar pins wearing chapels. <laughs> I think I remember her one time going to Tope that she almost gave out. I think we had to get somebody to carry her the last bit. That was when she was in her later years. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was wonderful. And I just have to say, I, I now live in the foothills in Montana and I still hike about three times a week and I have a hiking group and it's just part of my life. And that's thanks to Cody. Seems like we all owe our hiking to Cody and the amazing atmosphere here. Um, if I could quickly, um, if there's a Dr. Ed Tegenfeld in the crowd. What's that? I say it's great to see my the picture and his of uh, Frank Emerson and his wife. Uh, Frank was my roommate in Boys Block while we were in high school. Dr. Tegenfeld, um, how was hiking when you grew up, and how did you manage to do your hiking and balance your work as a doctor at school and Van Allen? Well, the, the first question um, was was back in the time when when boys at least could go out on hikes by themselves without any chaperone. And uh, Frank and my other roommate, Chris Rolls, and I uh, did a fair number of uh, Saturday hikes uh, and also Connie Hines. Um, I think Frank and Connie teamed up for many more than some of the rest of us, uh, but uh, Connie was such a hiker that he would hike down to Velagovy and back a couple times on Saturday um, and uh, then still maybe play some soccer in the afternoon. Uh, <laughs> yeah, quite an amazing hiker. Um, but when I, in 78, when, when uh, we moved uh, from, the, uh, from the Hyderabad area up to Cody, um, I was asked to be the school doctor and also uh, to be present because I was the only surgeon in the Cody Hills. Uh, they, they had none and uh, people would be going down to Madurai or, or other places uh, if they had uh, urgent, well, if they had any surgical need. Uh, and so uh, began helping uh, at Van Allen Hospital at the same time. And uh, Dr. Leela Uman, uh, was the doctor there, the resident uh, uh, physician at Van Allen. Uh, so she uh, did uh, most of the calls and I was just uh, working there as a surgeon uh, periodically when that was needed. And so Saturday mornings were free for me and it was wonderful to be uh, involved in the hiking program, even uh, getting a tarp in several years. And, and we sometimes broke up the group, one would go uh, the, the tar uh, pin uh, hike um, in January, as, as Sandy Schenninger just said, uh, we, we'd sometimes split up and I'd take one group over to Call Ridge and down past uh, the caves uh, in Manjanpati, uh, a good share of which was bushwhacking at the end because there wasn't any reason for any path to go between Kukal Cave and Manjanpati except for the animal. Yeah, right. And uh, the other group would go down. Um, I think you went down uh, from Pukal to Covenji and then from there on down uh, through right. the Mon past the Mundanbadi village, which is on the other side of the screen. Uh, most vivid memory of the Mundanbadi hike was when we did it as a family in, uh, in the May vacation time. Right. <laughs> and uh, Ruth Lockwood was along with us. Um, and, uh, was... <laughs> and we had uh, visiting herds of elephants that came through. Uh, <laughs> and Ruth was so worried about it that she sat up all night stoking the fire while the rest <laughs> of us slept peacefully. Um, right. But uh, the Munjampati hike was a, uh, was a high point. Uh, okay, thank you. Um... It must have been quite relaxing to take a nice break from your work and go on those amazing hikes. Um, since we're kind of short on time, we should move on to Miss Block. Um, Miss Block, what inspired your passion for hiking 
did you hike as a student? I wasn't in Cody in high school. And at that point, hiking was pretty much just offered for high school. But my grade six class teacher was John Weeby. And if you were in John Weeby's class, you went hiking because he would organize class activities quite regularly that involved hiking. Uh, Bruton Dorm also did some hikes, went down to Tope and up to Paramalai as a dorm group. And my parents, uh, their honeymoon was in the Rocky Mountains. So they were campers more than hikers maybe, but hiking was always a part of camping. So I have a lot of people I can credit with uh, giving me a love of hiking. The hiking program has changed a lot since Ms. Shenigo's time. Could you yeah. briefly explain some of the changes and why they have come about? Some, some of them are probably not as significant as they sound. Uh, they already had the point system broken up into A, B, C, and D hikes when I took over. But what often happened was you take kids on their first hike to Dolphin's Nose, they'd say three points, I need 85 for a tarpon, this is hopeless, I'm giving up. Or they would start saying, oh, I've got basketball. I, how many weekends do I have to dedicate to this? I've got other things I need to be doing. How can I plan? And minor annoyances were people big, finishing with one point, not needing one point at the end of a semester and having to be walked around the lake to get one point or getting lost for an hour on a hike and begging for one point because it would make so much difference. So what I did one year is I analyzed the two kids who had, had most quickly got their 85 points and found that they had done it in nine weekends. And so I looked at their formula and said, one A, two Bs, three Cs, three Ds, three Ds, you've got 85 points, or you're gonna be somewhere between 80 and 80 and 90, depending on which particular A's and B's you choose, but people can plan for nine weeks. They know how to make, they can say, oh, I've got basketball this week, but I can hike next week. I've got class camp here. Okay, I can do a B hike on my way to class camp. And it made it easier for high schoolers to start planning how they could make their the time frame work for them. But the points are already there. It followed the old system. Uh, when we do a new hike, we're still looking at three miles by road or two miles by well-used trail or one mile bushwhacking or rough trail as much as we can. Uh, often it's more sort of, okay, this one's similar to Gundar, so it's gonna be a bee hike. This one is similar to, and you parallel them with hikes that have similar time frame and busyness. Um, so that's one thing. We've talked already a little bit about routes changing. Uh, the Berjum area closed off first because it became uh, a reserve forest area uh, and became very difficult to get into. Not impossible, but when we started having to give lists with every kid's name and age on it uh, three days before the hike, and if somebody dropped out and somebody else came, they wanted an update and so much money per head and it started getting very, very complicated. Then uh, when all the forest lands in the hills were added to the reserve forest area, uh, by and large, a lot of hikes, they just shut down. Uh, getting to Ibex Cliff is almost pretty much impossible. And as Ian mentioned, a lot of our new routes have moved more east. So we have about four or five different paths crisscrossing the rat tail area, for example, going in one side, coming out another side, using roads that didn't exist back in the day. And in the last five, six years, a lot of trails going sort of towards Thandakuti, starting on the Polony Ghat from around Vatakavanji and either coming out lower on the Polony Ghat or crossing over behind Paramalmalai and coming out on Laws Ghat or coming out near Thandakuti. Uh, and so we found new ways and new trails and as Ian said, they also have, we've found some really neat new waterfalls, sometimes just five minutes off the road. They were there all those years. We were walking past them when we did the 80 mile round, but we never walked 10, five minutes downstream or 10 minutes downstream because you had to get to Cody before dark. You didn't have time to do many explores. Um, now, when we're hiking from Manjumbati to Pundi, there's time to sort of say what's downstream, what's upstream, we'll have a picnic here and we'll find out. So we have added some new hikes to the to the route, routes and are exploring some new areas. A lot more driving. 
But we also, even in Kuri, we will often now not drive kids even to something like you're going to do Gundarpur. We'll often drive them back, if not up, just because the roads are so chaotic. We don't want kids walking on those roads anymore. The traffic in is too dangerous. So we do a lot more driving to hikes, which which wasn't in there, there in the past as well. But that also lets us access new areas because we're driving anyways. It's it's really sad that students aren't exposed to this kind of history and information at this time. It's really good to know where it all started and how it's ended up the way it is. Um, I think I have another question for you. Yeah. Um, how have you created some of the newer hikers, uh, some of the new hikes that we do now? Um, sort of part combination of different things. Sometimes driving up and down, I would be looking someplace and saying, there's a road there, there's a path there. Some of our old hikes would say, there's a path turning off here. Where does it come out? It's got to hit the got road somewhere. We're coming down, say the Adukum Dolmens, we're coming down to the stream and we see a path going to the left or a path going to the right. And most often during vacation, a couple staff members who were, were not heading off to New Delhi or Kerala or something, we would follow one of those. Uh, we'd talk to villagers and we'd try and guesstimate where we were likely to be and tell the taxi to go wait there. Sometimes we'd have to walk an extra hour or so before we'd find our taxi because it came out lower or higher on the Got Road than the villager we talked to thought it would. Um, a lot of the ones that are going towards Thandaguri now, we have found by talking to the villagers in Vata Kavanji and saying, how can we get from here to Tandaguri? Can we get from here to Machur? Can we get from here to Panakaidu? And they will say, yeah, there's three ways to Tandaguri. You can go from here, you can go from there. And we keep trying them out and finding new routes that way. Some of our hiking guides, we now have four hiking guides that are, are hired because staff turn, turnover became just too much. We couldn't find enough people that knew the routes. For a few years, we had student guides that were running and guiding a lot of the programs. But then we started having a lot of our 11th graders drop out because of the IB program. So the kids who knew the routes were dropping out. So we have uh, four local people that we that do hike different routes and some of them have certain areas they know. But through them, we have learned new hikes too because when we hired Sarah as a hiking guide, he knew all the Cloudlands Palangi area and started taking us to new paths that ended up down at Elephant Valley, but from different ways than we used to go in the past. And I'm gonna say something. I learned a lot from Ed about how to figure out roots and remember them, looking at the lay of the land. I mean, a lot of people I hiked with like Sandy knew hikes, but there were always points where people would say, we always get lost. So Sandy, Sandy would say on the way to Munjambadi, we always get lost in this section. And Ed would take over and I'd say, Ed, what are you looking for? And he'd say, well, we always want to be on the right-hand side of the stream. It does, there might be 10 paths, but we have to stay on the right-hand side of the stream until we get to this ridge. And then we need to get to the left-hand side. So Ed, you taught me an awful lot about how to look for the lay of land and figure out roots and remember them that way. Thank you. <laughs> Yep, that's the beginning. Okay. This is Secret Stream near Ganeshpuram, Polar Waterfall. VIP Double Falls. Top of Twin Falls. So all of these are names that you probably won't recognize because they're new hikes. Barajum, you'll recognize that one. Uh, Cloudlands Ridge.
Elephant Valley area. Ganeshpuram Dolmens. Oh, thank you. Males knows. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Ms. Block, for your insights, because all of it is something that we all need to be aware of. And um, we're, go we're going to move on to Ms. Pippa. Um, Ms. Pippa, what, what inspired you to move to Cody, the hiking or the environment? <laughs> um, it was environmental work, but also necessity in some ways because I wanted to, I'd been working with the Bombay Natural History Society um, and on the committee for the BNHS. <coughs> um, I was writing a lot of environmental um, articles for magazines in Bombay for many years. I lived in Bombay for 17 years before I moved to Cody. And I definitely wanted the new environment, the mountains, the beauty, everything. And I wanted my children to enjoy it as well. And living in Bombay has this good moment, but it's also a very urban area. So although we used to go out bird watching every week, from the time both my kids were very small, we, we really needed to get away and have the ability to be able to enjoy nature and the environment and learn about how to protect it, which is a difficult job. But so that was really basically the reason why I came to Kobe. And I'm very glad I did. And we're all very glad you came here too. Uh, the next question is, um, how did hiking inspire you to write your book on the flora and shrubs of the Palni Hills? Um, in a way, from the moment I arrived in Cody and started to research material about the flora and fauna of the area, I really found very little. And what was there was brief and sometimes pretty boring, to be honest. Some of the older books, the 1940s, 1930s books, were very wordy. And um, they didn't clarify the different parts of the um, the flora and fauna, for example, when I write, I write it as um, <clears throat> I use um, distribution, description, leaves, flowers, fruit, and uses, and additional information, which makes it simple to understand. And I wanted to do that almost from the time I arrived in Cody. But first of all, I had to learn an awful lot about the environmental impact. And of course, things have changed desperately since I came to the school from the point of view. And I really wanted to teach students about the environment. Sorry, what are your views on hiking impacting those sholas the forest department is trying to preserve? Should hiking be restricted only to educational institutions or can we expand hiking to the new generation of adventure seeking tourists? Very difficult question because personally, I feel that education, environmental education is vital if we are going to protect the environment for the next generation. And because things are now getting more difficult, I, I personally think I understand the government's problem. The government does not want 9,000 tourists coming in in their saris, high heeled shoes, and all their jewelry 
rushing in and spoiling the environment. What they need to do, though, is to open up to schools all over the country and in other areas as well, part, all parts of the world, and allow them, because they are going for an educational environmental um, trek or camp or whatever it is, they must allow it. Um, and I remember writing to the Chief Conservator of Forests about this matter in, on several occasions, and they seem reluctant to allow ed environmental education, but that's got to grow. Students have to learn because the next generation is going to be without environmental education and with climate change rushing at the speed it is at this moment. Unless they can have the ability to go in and see the environment as it is. Tourists who are properly trained are fine, but we don't want six million tourists piling in and being able to see everything because that just won't work. And it hasn't in many parts of India um, where places have been ruined. So that's really, I think, a very, very important point. We, we, we name our hikes in Godi now by rather mysterious names. I think we've always done it a little bit just because naming something Jerry's Point doesn't tell anybody where it is, but it had meaning to Cody's school. <laughs> Cloudlands Peak, nobody knows where it is except us. So we named things because we didn't know local names. But now we intentionally go out on hikes and we name them things like the truly amazing Traverse, or VIP double falls. We don't want people going there and trashing places we're finding, so we're trying to protect them um, by giving them sometimes rather obscure names that wouldn't help somebody necessarily find where we were. In fact, we have Care Week hikes where we carry garbage bags and clean routes and come back with the garbage so that we're helping clean up places that people are trashing. Uh, Mr. Kevin, uh, class of 2003, can you tell us what prompted you to return to Cody and help Miss Block with the current hiking program? What what do you do in terms of arranging hikes? Uh, he doesn't help me. He's running it. Um, Maya, yeah. I'm sorry, my connection is a little bad, so your question came into bits and pieces. I heard okay, I'll, I'll, part of the first one. Um. Can you tell us what prompted you to return to Cody and uh, help with the current hiking program? What do you do in terms okay. of arranging hikes? And um, I understand you have to visit the forest department often for permissions. How does that work? So what prompted me to come back? Friends are still here. And uh, as a result of that, I keep coming back up and uh, Basically, I don't think city life was, and all the the concrete that you see around was something that was suitable for me. So up in the mountains is where I seem to kind of feel at home. And I guess that's what brought me back. With regards to the hiking program, as uh, Ms. Block had mentioned, we have the required number of hikes that we require students to do for the tarpon. So most of the I basically look mostly into the logistics of it and having the, the required hikes of the different categories spaced out over that uh, 14 weekend uh, span that we have, making sure there are enough A, B, C, and D hikes for the students to be a part of and uh, be involved in and ensure that they have the, the actual number of hikes needed for the, those who are going for their tarpons, even if they miss weekends or whatever, they have the, the necessary number of hikes available. So and so 
So that's basically how the logistics of this goes and just getting the signups put up now with the online system in place to ensure that it, it comes up on Monday for students and staff to get on to Kisnet to, to sign up for their. And then after that, we're on, we shut down signups on Wednesday to give us two days to, for all the transport and food arrangements that have to be made. The forest department, over the last few years that I've been here, the interaction with them has been different. Initially, it was just uh, sending them the lists of students going on hikes to particular areas and regions, and then having to go to the, the forest office to pay the, the required forest fees that they were collecting. But then after the, the fire tragedy that happened in the hills close by, there were whole new regulations that came in from the, the, the government itself. And after that, it's been more of a, a tough time with the forest department because they have been kind of, and they still are very much restrictive in which areas you can go to or where you can go or how many people can go. And the fact that they don't, even though we send out permission letters to the DFO and the rangers, stating that we have been doing these routes for X number of years and we have people who are guides and people who know everything in place. They still come up with that, oh no, but you can't go there, you can't do this, you can't do that. And, and they won't give you, at least for the, la the last one year, they haven't been giving written permission back to us to say that you can go to this particular, on this particular route or you can go to this particular area. And as a result of that, as was mentioned earlier, we had to find new paths which wouldn't touch into any of the forest areas. And that has, that difficulty that we are facing from the forest office, especially when DFOs change and ranges change and they're not in, they do not feel free to give out contacts of someone of a ranger in a particular area that you can get in touch with or things. So it has been kind of difficult, but we still try to get as much as we can out of them. In yeah, it sounds like quite tedious work as well as, um, yeah, it takes a lot of effort. Um, just a little bit mm -hmm. of um, information. Uh, I believe Mr. Kevin is the only student who has gotten a full seven tarpins in all his years in the, in as a student, right, Mr. Kevin? I don't I'm... think I'm the only student. I think I was the first, but okay. I think there have been a bunch after that. <laughs> what's the next uh, question? If oh, uh, first before that, um, Mr. Krause, since it's your birthday, if you have any fun hiking experiences or any information to share. Um, I don't really have uh, a lot to share, but uh, one of the uh, best hikes that uh, I took as a, as a kid, again, um, this was back in the day when uh, a bunch of guys could just get together and, and uh, sign up and go. And we used to, um, we went out uh, basically uh, on like uh, the 10 mile round, but then down uh, went almost uh, to Polney and then came up back up on the other side. Um, there's a bunch of uh, Putur, so Putur, um, um, Palam Putur, and that area, and then came back again. That was one. And then the one where I saw the most um, wild animals, um, uh, again, a friend of mine, uh, Bob Coleman, uh, we went to Munar and uh, took the road uh, down to Udamalpet. And from there, we came up uh, the Manjapati Valley and we saw uh, bears, elephants, um, all kinds of antelope. We saw three little bears, which is, I mean, it sounds like a story, but uh, uh, I guess it is a story in a sense. Um, and uh, wild dogs chasing, uh, chasing a, a deer uh, along. Anyway, so those were some of the ones that you know, we're really sort of exceptional. And then from Manjapati, then we walked up to Kukal and, uh, and back out uh, to uh, a waiting car and they took us up from, from Kukal. So anyway, those are some of the, the good ones. Of course, Tope was always fun too, uh, at least before the, the 
people who came along and broke uh, bottles and stuff down there um, until that time. That was really a lot of fun too. But yeah, had a great time. Fun too. But yeah, had a great time. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I've definitely heard a lot of things about Tope. It's really sad that the hike was canceled. Um, now, if anyone in the audience wants to speak, um, any experiences, any fun moments they want to share to do with hiking, you can go ahead, the floor is open. Could someone tell us about the Pundi property, when, it, when KIS acquired it, how and why? Probably a good one for Sandy. Sandy, you need to unmute yourself. Paul Weeby wanted to find a place where this, where we could have a camp. And he went out and kind of searched around. But when we first got there, it was all woods and, and um, so forth. And it's changed a lot since we first went. But I remember being with him sitting on the side of the hill when he was thinking about what we could do there. And um, the problem, I don't know how the lake is now, but but the problem at that point was the lake was uh, actually a reservoir for the town. And so sometimes they would empty it when they didn't have enough water. And sometimes there wasn't much lake and sometimes there was, but maybe that's gotten regularized more like now. But I think he just wanted a place because it seemed like, you know, I was beginning to be the time when there were more restrictions about going into the forest land and things like that. Was there anyone else who would like to talk? I'm yes. sure there is. John Cooper there. He's a former Clan Cullen buddy of mine. We used to take bikes uh, around the, uh, the 10, the 40, and the 80. Um, uh, very nice long rides, very, a lot of fun. Uh, my favorite hike, I think, was Tope, uh, and my Another favorite hike was Manjumpati. Um, Sandy, I went to Manjumpati a couple times with you and with Lauren Hunt. Uh, Gary Root, I believe, was on one. Oh, uh, oh we, yeah. Yeah, we actually caught little fish in the in the stream down there and fried them up. Um, and uh, who's talking? Pardon me. What's your name? I can't. Oh, Bob Edwards. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so appreciate all the time you took to uh, to go with us and uh, make make the make the hikes uh, really wonderful. Well, you were the one one of the ones that went on the on the uh, <clears throat> trial hike to Manjumpati with me when we were trying to figure out if we could have the camp down there. Well, that's right, and we stayed on the right hand side and eventually crossed over as as Barbara said. Right. Down, well, yeah. we were we were okay that time. It was the first time that we had the tar camp that we stayed too far right and we kept going right and right. And then we got, found this uh, wide river that we'd never crossed before. And, I remember uh, Miss Slifer's Jeep would pick us up at the very end. Pardon? Miss Slifer, she had a Jeep and she, her Jeep uh, moved yeah, to- That wide. was that week. But the, next, the yeah. next time, the next week when we took tar camp down, I don't know whether you were along, but, um, we, the first tar camp, we started out and the freshman boys that were going so fast were all leading at the front and I was at the back and it's very hard to control, control the group that's already gone off on a path. So um, we kept going on this path and we hit a wide river that we couldn't cross. And um, so then I got, I took, uh, I think you, Bob and, and Wendy, and we went across and looked from the hilltop. And I remembered that we'd never left a row of hills that were in the distance. So we turned uh, 90 degrees and went back across and finally hit the, the path and then got out. Yeah, that's right, I remember that. That Steve Root had said, now Sandy, don't be late coming back. <laughs> This is Ruth Gilson Fox. Um, we were in Cody from 67 to 70 only. But when I was in, my mom and dad were at the school there. And when I was in seventh grade, um, 
no offense intended to Pete Schmidt or, or anyone else from <laughs> my class, but the boys were terrible. They just wanted to play soccer for the activity every weekend and they didn't really want the girls to play and they couldn't figure out what they wanted to do. So one weekend the girls just said, well, we're going to hike to Berejum and Sandy and my mom, Rosemary Gilson, came to the rescue and said they would be our uh, chaperones to go on the on the walk to Berejum. Well, then the boys never got it together and said they wanted to go with us. And we said, no. <laughs> so just the girls, so just the girls took off and we went to Berejum and we're back. This is maybe a folktale because I'm thinking, how did we do this this quickly? But we were back for tea time, according to my records. And we had lunch there at Berejum. And so I always appreciated uh, Sandy's helping us uh, pull that off when we had some rebellion in the ranks. But. So it looks like I've negotiated with Ian to give us an update on the uh, some, some of the restoration work that's been going on. Yeah, so I mean, you know, I think you've heard from everybody that, you know, there's been from Barbara, we've heard about the changes and, and what's happened in terms of the rules. Um, of course, the vegetation has really changed. I mean, all of you, have, that's what I talked about last time was how dramatically the hills have changed. So the grasslands that you used to walk across when you went to Vandervu or, you know, Vembadi Peak, even like when I was a student, are all covered in, in plantation. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the forest department is doing some of their own restoration work. Um, they had been doing that with sholas. Uh, what they found is basically they don't need to do much with sholas. The sholas will come back on their own. But they're also experimenting with some grassland restoration down at the sheep farm in Manavanur. Um, oh, and that, that was based on the work of Bob and Tanya, who had done some sort of initial grasslands uh, restoration work. But it's not, it's not looking very promising for grasslands. So the, the strategy I, as I mentioned in my talk is basically it's very hard to restore them fully, but what you can do is try to uh, protect the, the last sort of remnants and existing patches. And there's still significant ones. You know, there's a, a Cody Facebook page that's not associated with the school and several people have been posting pictures of this new road that goes beyond Bilpati and uh, goes down that way. And they've, they've opened up whole new areas with, with a road, which is, of course, that's gonna spell its demise in the future. Um, so, I mean, there's, there still are areas around. That upper area between Berejim and, and Bandarbu is basically one large uh, pine eucalyptus, you know, sort of uh, oh, forest. How sad. Yeah. <laughs> But in, but in other areas, remember, you know, in other areas, in some of the plantations, the sholas are actually doing really well under the, under the plantation and they're taking over that. So there's this really fascinating sort of uh, ecological story going on in the Palni Hills right now. I, I'd like to, I'd like to say, am I muted? Um, we can, can hear you, you, okay, sure. We can hear you. I was going to say that the, the problem with you see the uh, grasslands have retreated now to 8%, 20 years ago it was over 20%, and the problem is acacia. The eucalyptus is actually not harming very much, and the um, sholas are doing extremely well. Um, growing up under eucalyptus, and I'm hoping that over time, um, sholas will renovate and they will be fine. But I don't have much hope for the grassland if acacia cannot be removed because acacia are nitrogen fixers and grassland cannot last with nitrogen. And so that is why, and it's very, very difficult to get rid of acacia. It needs an awful lot of manpower to remove it. Um, there is one, one form of acacia now which has got a fungal infection and is dying, but the other two prevalent species are unfortunately doing rather well. 
and and is it true is it not true pippa or in that um that 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 acacia is actually a cash crop across the hills it was not it much be. anymore oh be used, used for tanning and um, bisco but tan india is gone and bisco is gone um so no it's used for the, you can fell trees and um i'm sorry branches and they Firewood. use our wood and uh, head loaders will pick up the uh, branches but um, difficult to get rid of unless you you have methods of doing it but you need an awful lot of people to do it which is uh, just a quick cut off. Um, can Mr. Karthik Vasudevan, I see you shared a lot of pictures on the Padlet. If you'd like to share a bit more how you took these pictures and any stories that you have. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I was class of 91 and um, a big shout out to uh, everybody who was there during that period from 86 to 91. Uh, some of my fondest memories are definitely from the hiking program. And, uh, you know, it was not that common for us to have cameras out there. Um, yeah. And most of us were, were not really as prolific as, as Ian was taking uh, photos. But these were just a handful from uh, a variety of, of hikes. So nothing no great stories there, but uh, we have had a few a few stories uh, from I think it was the 80 mile round. I remember coming upon a herd of elephants with uh, Feller Bose and there was a baby elephant and it was one of these most just tremendous experiences to uh, to to see honestly I did it's an, it's indelible in my memory. Um, we have lots of lots of fond memories, and there are a number of people um, on this call who have shared stories with me from class of '91. Uh, if Indran's willing to share the story about the bison, I think everyone would get a good laugh. Indran, are you available? Thanks, Vasu, for putting me on the spot. Uh, in, I, before I start, I, in such a talking about the story, I want to thank. Um, I see uh, Dr. Tegenfeld, Mrs. Tegenfeld, Ms. Sandy Shaniga, Ms. Pupa Mukherjee. Thanks very much for teaching us the skills on hiking. I, I got five tarpins when I was there, and now I'm in Canada, and um, it's, it's a lifelong experience. It's something that I've been doing every weekend, and I want to thank you guys very much for making the effort to get us out there, give us our lunch packets, our breakfast uh, packed lunches, and then making sure that we had an enjoyable experience on a hiking. As for the story, I'll make it short. Um, it was me, Mark Tegenfeld, David Estes, and I forget who the fourth person was. And this was on the, uh, the tarping camp, um, the tar camp, and we were hiking down the hills. And one, one thing about going on a tar camp is you do see wildlife that you usually don't see on regular hikes, and we came across a herd of bison. So the first reaction, what we did was, um, what normally normally what Cody kids do is we started chasing the bison. So we were going, so the bison herd started running. We were running after the bison and then they went over a hill uh, and disappeared. And so we kept running, we ran up the hill. And as soon as we got uh, towards the top of the hill, I saw Mark suddenly stop in his tracks, and I wasn't sure why he stopped. And then I walked up, came, I was in the next in line. And as I came up the hill, um, what we saw was that the, the herd of bison had gone over the hill and right next to it, next to the herd was the bull elephant. I'm sorry, the bull, bull bison. And they were looking, the bull was looking right at us. We were looking right at the bull. And next, next thing we know, the, the roles were reversed and the bulls started chasing us. And we were running over the hills, trying to get away as fast as we could. 
And I think, I believe I would have broken every single world record in terms of the speed that all four of us seem to have got. And we ran as fast as we could. Um, yeah, so that was a, a very good experience. <laughs> Quick deviation. Mr. Rainer, Rainer Halama, uh, class of 72. Uh, I noticed that you also have some really interesting photos on the Padlet. Um, one's going on the road to Berijum to Elephant Valley. Would you like to share this story as well? Camera because um, I'm using my uh, regular uh, uh, desktop computer, which can't hook up to the camera. Uh, well, yeah, uh, I just enjoyed the hike, uh, hiking um, in the early 70s, uh, mostly, well, Al Shaw, Sandy Schoeninger uh, uh, took us as honest chaperones. Sometimes we uh, did all these, uh, all, also the unchaperoned hikes. And um, I think it's, uh, it, it was just like a, a, a big, big adventure uh, in, in a way, you know, you, you, you uh, you go out, you hike down to the plains, you see your first uh, a wild peacock in your life. For, for me, a peacock always was some kind of uh, 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 bird who runs around castles in, in Germany as a uh, fancy bird and suddenly you see uh, those things live out in the wild. Uh, you you uh, didn't see the elephants in Manjampati, but you heard them at night, you know, walking almost through camp and it's kind of like, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, you're, you're right in the middle of it. And uh, those were the night, uh, uh, things you enjoyed. Of course, you you uh, stepped on snakes or you swam with snakes. And uh, uh, nowadays you kind of think, yeah, is that just a tall uh, uh, a tale you you uh, uh, tell from uh, uh, past times? So did you really did you really experience these things after all? You know, it's kind of like uh, uh, in uh, after all these years, you know, memories also uh, sometimes expand a little bit. <laughs> but yeah, it was uh, just a, a, a great way. One thing it's 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 kind of like uh, uh, I I I started liking hiking for life in uh, uh, in at Cody. It's like uh, in on the first hikes I walked along in the first season, I was always way in the back, and uh, we wanted to, uh, wanted to take a rest. You know, you kind of uh, uh, caught up with a group, and uh, they had rested, and then they uh, got up again, and uh, uh, you had you hardly had had any rest, and so you finally decided, well, okay, if you want to take if you want to have rest on the way, you you uh, uh, better uh, go with the with the people in front, you know, and that's actually how I got my stamina to go on hikes. <laughs> <laughs> So oh, you know me. how the chaperones felt. <laughs> well, no, I, I don't really have any tall tales or, you know, kind of things like that. I mean, it's kind of like, uh, yeah, skinny dipping at Manjampati at night where uh, 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 nobody could see anything and things like that. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ian, would you like to share a story or two from Padlet? Um, I, you have a whole bunch of stories from the 80s and some wonderful photos. Yeah, I, yeah. I, okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share a Padlet. I, I, the skinny dipping story, I, had a, I have to share one that was, uh, I think probably a lot of us have stories that we, I think I can share this, but we, we did taupe. I think the lock enders, the boys in lock end all did all the taupe slides and it was a really painful experience is all I can remember from it. But anyways, I'm sure every, everybody has their own <laughs> stories about it. So look, what I'm gonna do uh, is I wanna share this, this screen with you, the Padlet, because I'm not sure if everybody gets what this is, whereas that we have uh, of hiking and Cody, and then we can look at it, we can go through, and I don't, if, and I don't know if you're doing this, if you're watching this show on a phone, this is gonna be very frustrating, but hopefully you have a really big computer screen in front of you. And if, if you know, later on, maybe you can go to the link and, and see it. But because what we've done is we put pictures here and you can see pictures 
like this is this classic one that I think Manjusha got right from one of the publications of, of a hike sometime probably early 20th century or whatever up in Cody. Uh, I'm not sure exactly I where. I love the ferns in this photo. It's this beautiful. Yeah, yeah, the ferns, you know, and, and the grasslands and the rolling hills and then the topi hats that, you know, people had back then, right? And uh, some of you probably in your, your childhoods would have worn those. I know like in, in my family, we have pictures of people with those hats. So we've, we've, we've got these pictures here. We've got some of like, you can see Barbara's sketches where she's sketched some of the old uh, pictures. Barbara, do you want to say something about that? I've been doing a project for the dining hall, which is being, un, being renovated. And instead of putting photographs on the wall, the designer, it's a secret, so Maya, don't tell people, uh, asked me to do sketches. Uh, and so we've been going through the eras and they're not just hiking pictures, they're pic all kinds of pictures that we found from the 30s up to the 30s, one section. So she's gonna have different pillars and columns and areas as people walk through the dining hall, they're gonna be seeing the history of Cody. Uh, with little comments either either taken from the Yuki if it came from a Yuki or my own comments on where the place was and what people were doing and what I know of the story uh, to make it kind of interesting if they want to stop and read. So I've put a few of the hiking ones in here because uh, they seem to fit this timeline. Great, yeah, so thanks. Good. And I've added a couple maps with some annotations uh, here. Let's see if it loads up. But these are some of the old survey maps that we used to use uh, when we were out there. Um, but if you go through and we get up to Reiner's pictures right here, that we were just talking to him about these. And these are, um, I mean, what's nice is we've got the years. So we know, you know, 1972. Reiner, did you do your own developing and printing of your pictures back then? No, I didn't. I, uh, uh... I uh, brought them to, to Donovan's, or if it was slides, uh, I even sent them in. How is it that they survived all these years? You've kept them carefully, I suppose, huh? Yes, I mean, I have, uh, uh, on the one hand, I do have a, an, an album, and uh, some of these are actually uh, photographed out of the album. But I also do have uh, uh, some of the negatives still. And uh, I hope to more or less try to do uh, some uh, scanning of the negatives uh, again. And uh, with uh, Lightroom and all these things you have today, I probably um, might even be able to improve on the quality. Great, yeah. Yeah, it's a big challenge for all of us. And, and if you, <laughs> all of you who have these hiking pictures and, and pictures of the hills, uh, these are really important records. So say like your like this picture of Berjum showing the grasslands and you know the sort of the hills without any vegetation. These uh, you know I'm, are really exciting sort of as a record of of a time now you know changed forever. And of course you can't even we can't even get a current picture. You just heard Barbara tell us how difficult it is even to get out to places like Berjum. So very special pictures. And I mean, these, it looks like these are like Kodachrome pictures you've got, Reiner, um, here. Yes, exactly. Those are, those are Kodachromes. These are uh, slides. Okay. And so, the nice thing about the Padlet is you can put them in chronological order. So you actually see things through time. Yeah. So what we've asked is if for you, when you put a, a year on your uh, picture, then any of us who are the editors can move them around if you haven't. It's a bit, it's a bit of a pain to, to bring them uh, to move them around, but you can. Um, but there's lots of pictures. I've then it goes from Reiner's pictures in the 70s up. I've got some ones from the 80s here, and um, and I, I like to write little annotations. So if you go into the pictures, if you want to hear about the Mushroom Ridge and things about why it was called that, I'll let you read that yourself. Um, you can go into that there. Ian, then, uh, there's a question from Tim Zorn, 63, in the chat. Have ferns yeah. disappeared uh, in, from the hills? We used to yeah. cut ferns for mattresses when camping. For brackets. It seems, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to turn it over to Pippa because she's our vegetation expert. I wouldn't want to say anything that is not right. So let's ask Pippa. <laughs> There's still a lot of bracken out there. I was going to say that there's still an awful lot of bracken, but there are 
still a lot of quite rare ferns, and they are very beautiful. So I wouldn't say that um, there's been a terrific uh, disappearance, and of course they love shade, most ferns, but um, Bracken is still there and could probably still make jolly good mattresses if you wanted to use them. <laughs> yeah, that was a good Cody tradition. We did it in Kukal Caves and a bunch of other places. But anyways, um, moving on, we've got Karthik, who we've, we've heard from. He's posted a lot of nice pictures from the 80s or 90s, early 90s, right? He's class of 91, right, Karthik? Um, so, and these taupe pictures, right, which are, you know, we... I think what, what, what he mentioned was really true. We weren't all taking cameras out. And the reason I started taking a camera out is because my dad bugged me about it and said, look, you better take something out and document this because you'll, you'll appreciate that at some point. So um, I'm glad I did. Uh, but it was, you know, back then we were using film and everything. But so Karthik's got a lot of pictures here. I've got some pictures from, we were talking about like hiking in sandals, right? And those of it, people in my family will recognize those chuckles right there. Uh, and the, the rest of us, you know, are all, this is the Deyoung's, uh, Bruce, and I think Hansi, his, there's his feet. And these are, this is Anna Lockwood, my cousin's feet. She's got plastic bags on. We put some nasty salt out here, not just salt, but also like uh, castor oil and tobacco. We used all kinds of things to try to keep the leeches off. Uh, anyways, Kukal stories are, are important. So we have a lot of cool call stories. Somebody uh, has posted this nice, the 3D map uh, that is somewhere in, in Cody schools. I'm not sure who made this, but it's, it looks very nice, very interesting model. I have one that was made for me that I have here in my house. <laughs> oh, you need to post a picture, Sandy, and, and share that with us. I'll have to do that. <laughs> you just I don't know how to. I don't know how to do it. I need education. <laughs> <laughs> we'll help you out. We'll help you out. Um, Ian, this is lifelong your learners. Ian, this is your cousin Karen, aka Hi, Kiki here. Um, I don't see any pictures from the hike that we took to the bottom of Rat Tail, uh, but that was pretty epic. Yeah, because I my with Dad and Brian. And I wasn't on that trip oh. with you, but um, so I don't have the pictures, but I think my dad, Merrick has the pictures huh. of that. I had one picture of a rat tail at the bottom when I first went with uh, Brian and Barthi and, and dad on that. Um, and that several of you have also talked about rat tail because that was a very, you know, going to the bottom of that was one of the most surreal kind of experiences if you ever what? if you ever got a chance to go up there and it was an effort of uh, great physical fitness and gymnastics and everything to get and uh, to get up there so that's it these are the kinds of stories that we've shared on the padlet and i hope if you haven't had a chance to see it go through it Ian? um we've got uh, mary emerson yes? would you hi hi mary would you uh go over or have somebody send us directions on how we can access the, the Padlet. Yeah, okay. I think we'll put the, let's post the address again in the chat. There's a chat over here on the side uh, that's there. And it's also on, on your Facebook pages if you have it, or it's in emails out there, but we'll put it in the chat. All right, maybe Manjusha can do it again. Ongoing, it's not finished, right? The Padlet is, is not finished, but you're welcome to all, uh, look at it, participate. You can write your own sort of anecdotes, your stories, if you want to share those on that space. It's something new we wanted to try. We wanted to make this interactive so that the audience, you guys are all really important. You can participate in, in the talk. So that's it from on my little bit here. I'll turn it back to Maya. Yeah, thank you so much. That was all very interesting, very informative. Um, I saw earlier that someone had asked about um, the Gundar uh, accident where somebody survived falling down the Gundar Falls. If anyone knows <laughs> about that. I remember that. I do remember um, the two boys who fell down. I'm just trying to remember their names. So I think Barbara would know or Sandy definitely. 
What, the ones that fell down? Um, was Weeby? No, it wasn't one class. of the Weebies. It Weebies was, um, no, um, Weeby ran back to the school. What? Oh, I, it was, he was Alma? one of the four, though. <laughs> Oh, it was no. uh, Fatahali, one of the Fatahali boys. Yes. From him, he said it was at Gundar Falls. Um, let me see right. here. Uh, it was uh, Hashim and Almar fell. Harold Minzi was with them at first, but went back early. Wendell and I came later, and I saw them at the bo bottom of the big Gundar Falls, and then they oh. ran back. Okay. Somebody tell that's, that's according to Roland, who was there. Right. Somebody tell or Raleigh. And then they went out that night, but they just, um, they got, um, it got dark and they couldn't see anything. And they actually dropped a sleeping bag over the, over. And the next day they found it uh, on a rock above them. <laughs> and then Steve Root went down by the ropes to get them. Yeah. And then they, um, so then uh, they had to take, they took all the police and everything because they really thought they weren't alive anymore. And so, yeah, so um, uh, what? What? So then. Uh, uh, someone's got their someone's thing on it. Anyway, so they, just... they came back in and with, we were all standing outside church wondering what had happened. And they came in with thumbs up and everybody started singing the doxology. <laughs> but the boys, the boys climbed up the rope and got to the car faster than the chaperones did. But there were other times too that people got lost. Um, how many were of you were on the tar camp when uh, the girls went off the path to to uh, to, uh, <laughs> to have a bathroom stop and they um, I don't know what year it was but anyway <clears throat> they went so far off the path because they thought Dr. Tegenfeld was coming along and they didn't want him to see them to him to see them so they went so far off that when they st started back they didn't know what direction to go. And we got uh, everybody there and then they weren't there. So um, we figured out about where, but finally some villager, when we called the police and everybody, and then um, finally some of the villagers went up on the hill and they spotted them and then they came down and brought them in. There's a Chuck Goslink Gos on, on, the, on the call. Chuck, would you like to share a story? I know you're class of 53. Yeah, I'll tell a story. I'll, uh, many of you, uh, yes, I was class of 53. And uh, many of you know my brother-in-law, Sam schmidt -Hinner. Yep. So when Sam was a student at Cody, he and his friends had a reputation for getting into a lot of trouble. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> you know, trouble in those days was much different from trouble today. But anyway, right. uh, they were kind of a, a, a problem for the then principal, Mr. Phelps. And some of you remember Phelps. Well, um, Sam went back to college and seminary and came back as a missionary, um, as many of you know. Uh, I was a, uh, a senior, I think, in high school at that point. And we decided that we'd really like to take a bike hike. Um, and uh, so Sam and Jim Schaefer and I uh, got bikes and we biked uh, all the way out to Vandervu and then down to Top Station and Munar. We had a great time, but we had to take three days, which meant we had to miss one day of school, which we thought was easy enough. Nobody would miss us. <laughs> uh, we, we biked to back and uh, got back in time on Sunday and, and uh, Monday morning when we arrived at class, they said, oh, you're in trouble, you're in trouble. And very soon, Pa Phelps invited us down to his office. And uh, 
he asked us about this trip. And then he said, was Sammy Schmidt enter with you? <laughs> and we had, we had to admit that Sammy Schmidt had indeed be with, been with us and planned this thing with us. Anyway, that was a great, a great trip, a, a, a wonderful bike trip, bike hike, uh, all the way down to Munar. And uh, I remember that as my best hike. I don't know. The, I don't know that the road between uh, uh, between Vandervu and uh, and Top Station uh, does it does it exist anymore? Boys, I can comment on that if you want. the The road um, basically up to Vandervu is is non-existent. It, the forest has been allowed to grow over it. Trees have fallen on it. You wouldn't even recognize it's a road. Um, it's amazing how quickly that's become overgrown. Uh -huh. And I think what Barbara was saying is as you go out, I mean, you have to take, you need like a power saw with you or something like that, a band saw, something, because the road is so un unpassable. And we were driving it, we were taking Jeeps over, I think, as late as like 2000 and five 2007 and then the forest department basically i think purposely uh allowed it to be overgrown because they didn't want people out there the problem is they can't monitor it so that that means we really don't nobody really knows what's going on out there mm -hmm. on the kerala side going from vandervu down to top station that's become a national park and they maintain that road enough that they can take jeeps up to vandervu where they have a, a watch state they have a watchtower up there and they have a radio station up there. So it's really interesting how the Kerala side has managed their forests and they're, they're doing it, I would say, much better. They're really, they've really got their act together and in, for the benefit of conservation and wildlife. Um, but they haven't, you know, sort of, you know, just blocked everything off. You can go to Pampadam Shola, you can buy a ticket to go inside and you can see some really interesting wildlife. The Shola is there, very similar to what we have in the Palnis, because it actually is in the Palnis, but it's on the Kerala side of things. Is Vandervu on the Kerala side? It's on the, it's right on the, on the border. So that road that went, oh, goes over there is, is, passes the border. And that was famously known as the highest motorable road south of the Himalaya, <laughs> right? For many years, that's what, the, what everybody knew it as. And it's true, that's what it was. It's no longer motorable though. Uh, unfortunately, so we can't talk about it anymore. Yeah, I was uh, I was out there. Uh, well, you know, many years after I graduated, but hiked out to Vandaru and uh, over to the road, just walking along the ridge there, and then down into the shore. And I was amazed that the road was just—it seemed to me impo impassable at that point. So it may be that the Kerala Forest Service has has uh, fixed it up again. I, th I don't think it's fixed up greatly, but enough for them to take Jeeps up. Now, remember that road was built right during World War II, right, as an escape route for the Japanese invasion that was imminent at any point. So no, I've forgotten that, but now I remember, yeah. So that's the origins of that road. And I mean, there's, there's you know, pillar, there's um, milestones along it where it still says like Cochin and Munar in one direction and Kore Canal and Madra on the other other side of it. Um, Ian, that road was also the road that uh, the Frank, Frank Jayasinghe used to escape from Cody. That's yeah. right. The Sri Lankan students and, and Frank and Jayasinghe and the whole group went out uh, on that road. So it's, yep. it's, it's a really important road in, in terms of Cody's history. It's kind of sad what's happened because, I mean, they had built bridges and everything on it, right? If with it just fallen apart now. Coming. Benjamin, please go ahead. Uh, I had a question. One, I, I was the one that had made that map, that three-dimensional map. Ah. And uh, I had left one of them with the uh, library back when I was out in the year 2001. And I'm, I don't know whether it's still there. I still have a map. I, I'm some, I have a, a, a duplicate of it. And I'm sort of wondering what to do with it, to be quite honest with you and uh, wonder if there was any interest of it. But it raises the question, uh, maybe I'm way out of date, but has any use been made of GPS 
in your hikes and trying to register points so that you could know just exactly where you were? Um, in, in the last few years, we've got staff who've been doing using programs like Map My, Map My Walk and Rambler to record the routes that we've been taking. And those programs also, if you take a photograph, it inserts the photograph on the route at the exact point you're standing, which is good if you're at a division in a path, you can even intentionally take a picture and say left side. Uh, we haven't posted those for public. We've kept them sort of within the school community uh, for some of the same reasons we mentioned earlier. We don't want other people going to Rambler and just picking it up. We want to be able to vet who's going on some of those routes. Um, I don't know that there's been a conscious effort to really keep them in one place or something. Uh, most of the hike routes are still in our heads. I'm, I could, do, I could, you, I could map it like that, but I would never hike that way because that's not how I've learned to learn use trails. It would just irritate me to be looking at a device and trying to read the map there. I, I hike a different way. But thank you, thank you. Hey, thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yes. This is Hi, Hans. Hans. Um. So this is like a family reunion also because I saw my brother Pete and sister Chris and my uncle Chuck who just spoke. But I just first wanted to thank Barbara for her wonderful pictures and keeping us all sort of vicariously involved, you know, with hiking. It's so wonderful. Um, so I just wanted to mention that, you know, hiking is where my mom and dad fell in love. Because if you read my dad's book, it's called Ramblings with Ruth. In the very first chapter, even if you don't want to read the whole book, just read the first chapter. There's a wonderful description of a hike to uh, Palm Bar Falls, which is called Snake Falls, at right. the bottom of Levering Stream. And uh, how they hiked out of there with ropes straight up the hill to uh, Priest Walk. And they, my dad took ropes along. For some reason, many of his stories include ropes and cliffs. <laughs> but I just wanted to uh, mention it. It's it's a it's a family tradition. It, you know, our family is steeped in this uh, stories about hiking. And uh, you can read about some of those in that book. Or oh, do you want to hear some of this? It's it is kind of long, but um, he talks about taking my mom down Levering Stream, which I think that's the Leverage Stream. And they went down through rocks and so forth. But uh, he, to get there, they first walked past the monastery where Fritz and I used to steal pears <laughs> to an avenue of huge eucalyptus street, past trees, past St. Mary's Church and La Providence Franciscan Monastery and finally down to Leverage Stream. We followed the stream down to the first waterfall. And one side it was dry so we could climb down. Knowing the way, I descended first and helped Ruth with, with her footholds. We passed magnificent old boulders that had split off from cliffs. Some of the huge rocks were covered with moss, leaf mold, ferns, vines, and flowers of many kind. One vine had thick waxy latex filled leaves with pink and red flowers that smell like cinnamon. These were wild begonias, orchids. There were wild begonias, orchids, red trumpet flowers, and jack in the pulpits. Even great trees grew in some, on some of the rocks, sending roots down around the boulders to find soil and water. I said, Ruth, this is God's rock garden with plants more abundant and beautiful than any gardener could raise. She liked that. And then he talks about black monkeys, ooga, ooga. <laughs> and he talks about uh, the Malabar squirrels, whistling schoolboys, thrushes, and uh, all kinds of descriptions. Delicate small flowers grew in the seepage soaked moss at the stream's edge. So this chapter is full of imagery like that. Even if you don't have a picture, you can sort of imagine it in your mind. And then he talks about um, coming to ledges and waterfalls where he takes his ropes out and helps my mom climb down the ropes. It's scarier than, I don't know. It reminds me of the 
two kids that fell down Gundar, but somehow, you know, they made it. They, I climbed down and steadied the rope for her and down she came. I helped her and she came naturally into my arms. So, <laughs> yeah. So my dad, th this whole book is a love story in actuality. It's, <laughs> it's about hiking and everything else, but uh, yeah. So I'll stop there. I'm, I'm just gonna butt in. I think Maya needs to say good night to all of us. <laughs> Yeah, and also, we're just gonna have right. a chat before my her computer on the boat dying. Yeah. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Maya. Experience learning the history of hiking and all that. It's been really great. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Maya. The chat is still open. I mean, the the talk is still open, and those who wanna, um, you know leave can leave or you can continue talking it's it's a free floor now yeah,